I, I think we're going to go ahead and, and get started. I know people will probably still be filtering in over the next minute or two. Uh, but for the moment, good evening. Uh, my name is Esther Peters, and I am the Associate Director at the Center for East European and Russian Eurasian Studies at the University of Chicago. And I am excited to welcome everyone to tonight's series of voices with Catherine Verdery. Uh, series of voices is an author-centered series of readings and conversations on books from or about Central and Eastern Europe, Russia and Central Asia and the Caucasus. Our long-term partner for this series is the Seminary Co-op Bookstore, the first not-for-profit bookstores whose mission is book selling. Although the stores remain closed to the public, uh, they are fulfilling orders and supporting book sales for virtual events like this one through their website, semcoop.com. And when you place your order, you can choose from shipping, delivery to local area codes or curbside pickup. You can find information about upcoming events in this series and other events uh, at temp.com and the series website. Uh, and you'll find links to uh, both of those sites in the chat box below. Before I turn tonight's event over to our two speakers, I would like to mention the remaining events in the series. On May 26, Paul Wilson will be discussing his recent translation of Bohumil Hrabal's The Gentle Barbarian with me. And we will close out this year's series of voices uh, on June 2nd with Faith Hillis, who will be discussing her recent book, Utopia's Discontents, Russian Immigrants and the Quest for Freedom with Tara Zara. And you can find information uh, about the events and those books and how to register uh, using the links provided in the chat box. Uh, tonight, as I mentioned, we are excited to welcome Catherine Verdery to discuss her book, My Life as a Spy, Investigations in a Secret Police File. She is the Julian J. Studley Faculty Scholar and Distinguished Professor of Anthropology at the Graduate Center of the City U University of New York and the author of numerous books, including, but certainly not limited to, The Vanishing Hectare, Property and Value in Post-Socialist Transylvania, and Secrets and Truths, Ethnography in the Archive of Romania's Secret Police. She will be joined this evening by Eugene Reichel, the current director of series and associate professor in the Department of Comparative Human Development at the University of Chicago, his book, Governing Habits, Treating Alcoholism in the Post-Soviet Clinic, was published by Cornell University Press in 2016. And two last notes before I turn things over to Professors Verdery and Reichel. We will be raffling uh, up to 10 copies of My Life as a Spy to interested attendees. So if you are interested in potentially receiving one of those copies, please introduce yourself uh, with your name and email address in the chat box. and we will. Uh, let people know about that. Uh, and of course, we will have time for uh, questions at the end of the box. Uh, at the end of the at the end of this event, you can use the Q and A box, which is open uh, at any point. Uh, you can enter your own question, or if you are particularly interested in a question, you can upvote uh, those questions. And with that, I will turn things over to Professors Reichel and Verdery. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hi. Great. Thanks so much, Esther. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, just a quick word of uh, additional word of introduction. Um, I wanted to say that, you know, for many of us anthropologists who started uh, to carry out field work uh, in what was by then the post socialist world in the 1990s or, or later, uh, Catherine Verdery was really a, a pioneer. Uh, one of the few uh, U.S. anthropologists or ethnographers who carried out uh, field work in the uh, Second World, um, uh, someone whose singular articulation of state socialism as a political economic system based in careful ethnographic work uh, posed key questions for what came after the collapse or dismantling of those regimes in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, and personally, I'll say as an undergraduate uh, with an emerging interest in post-Soviet Russia at the University of Michigan in the mid-1990s, I recall my own excitement at learning that this pioneering anthropologist of the socialist world had joined my university's anthropology department. Um, 
uh, albeit uh, briefly before moving on to uh, CUNY. Uh, and I remember as well at the time that the subtle, cleared systemic account um, offered in uh, a book that Esther didn't mention, uh, What Was Socialism and What Comes Next, uh, which was a really important um, one for, for, for uh, the field of post-socialist anthropology. Um, so the book we'll be discussing today, My Life as a Spy in Investigations in a Secret Police File, uh, published in 2018 by Duke University Press. It, this is really an extraordinary book, uh, drawing on your reading of your surveillance file, which the Romanian Securitate compiled. Um, it, it's, it's, an, it's a really interesting melding of different genres, a kind of memoir, uh, autoethnography, uh, analysis of um, of the of the security state in Romania, um, maybe we can start just by uh, if you could say a few words about how you came to to write this book. Um. I never intended to write this book. It sort of forced itself on me when I um, was doing my research in Romania. I always assumed that there was some kind of surveillance that was. Uh, being placed on me, but I really didn't know much about it. And I didn't find the secret police presence too um, obvious. Occasionally I would come back into my, I had a suitcase um, that was very hard to open once it was locked. And I would put all my field notes in this suitcase and lock it if I were going away any place and I would come back and it would still be locked. So that was my way of checking to see what they were up to. And I didn't see much evidence. Now, um, obviously that was a fairly uh, uh, seat of the pants kind of uh, attempt to follow my observers. But I, I basically didn't think about secret police very much because if I did, it would have been paralyzing. I was more interested in finding um, people to talk to and taking my field notes and so on. Um, I was there a number of different times um, in, for my dissertation field work in 19, um, when was it, 84, 85? I can't even remember when, that, when it was. I was there for over a year. Then I went back for a couple of shorter visits, three months, two months, whatever. After the uh, collapse of the, uh, Communist Party in Romania. I went. Um, I went back to research the process of getting of people getting their land back, um, and that was really fascinating. And produced my book, The Vanishing Hector. Um, I stayed. You know, I, I either traveled to or stayed in the country for almost a year and a half for that project, um, and then um, I guess. It was in, I'm not certain of this date, I think it was 2009 that the Romanian um, government decided to do what a lot of other East European countries were already doing, and that was opening the archive of the secret police to its uh, former victims and to other people who had, you know, researchers who had a claim to read it. Uh, this had been permitted by a law passed in the Romanian parliament um, uh, a few years earlier, and it was to prove a very complex uh, matter to administer. But one way or another, I found out that I had one. Um, I found out that it was some 2,000 pages long altogether in uh, six or seven large volumes. And I was sort of appalled at the idea, but various friends said, oh, you should get it, it might be interesting. So I ordered it up and uh, um, sat down in the reading room of the uh, um, secret police uh, archive and started reading this thing. And I found myself becoming more and more astonished by what I was finding, the degree of penetration of my quarters the um, extent to which they were hoping to follow my every move, um, the friends that they approached to talk about me and things like that. So I, I found it very harrowing to read all of this. And uh, 
when it was over, I decided, well, maybe I should write a memoir based on this because it might be interesting for other people. I didn't think at the time that it might also prove cathartic for me, but to some extent, I, I think that was true. So um, that's kind of the background. Um, we'll, we'll get into the, um, into the, the details of what you found in the, um, in, in, in the file uh, in a moment, but maybe to set the bit of context, um, you were one of the first US anthropologists to conduct field work in, in the second world. Um, how did this, and, and also just the overall context of the Cold War shape the kinds of assumptions uh, that you came into your field work with, your approach to ethnography when you were first starting out in the mid early uh, 1970s? Um, I didn't really know much about what I was doing, if I should be honest. Uh, there had been um, almost no research in any part of Eastern Europe up to that point. And the only work in Romania had been done by uh, a linguist whose work I had not followed. So I, <clears throat> I was really, you know, jumping into the pond pretty unprepared. Um, and then uh, I ended up not having too much trouble finding a place to do my research. My grant was uh, overseen by an organization called the Romanian um, Council for Science and Technology. And they were pretty efficient. They asked me what I wanted to do. I sent them my proposal already. I said I wanted to go to this village or to a village. I had picked this one out of sort of nowhere because I saw a TV program about it while I was right after I got there into Bucharest. And um, I thought that it would be, uh, you know, interesting to be in Transylvania because it's a more interesting part of the country. It has three different ethnic groups and a very complex history of um, belonging to the Hungarian kingdom and the Romanian uh, provinces and so on, different times uh, in history. So I settled on this and um, my advisor, uh, Mihai Pop, said to me, uh, let's go out there together. Uh, and we got on the train and took an eight hour train ride. I, I certainly have never done this to any, for any of my students. Um, and uh, he, we got introduced to some possible families that I might stay with. And uh, in the first evening, he asked them to call together his, um, th the family's mother and father, old, old um, folks, and a school teacher and a couple of other, all together we were about seven or eight people. And he began to interview them about this village. And this was uh, enlightening for me because in my graduate program I'd had absolutely no training in field methods. So I just knew you were supposed to ask people stuff but I really had no idea of the details of how to do that. So um, then he went back to Bucharest and there I was all by myself. My first problem was to try to meet a few people. My landlady was a wonderful gal who knew practically everybody in the village. And she said, oh, you should go see these people. You should go meet this person. And sent me off to um, get to know a few of the people who became really central to the book that I ended up writing. Um, now, lest I go on forevermore, what else would you like me to say about this experience? Um, well, I, I think it's that, that was a good preface to the, my next question, actually, which is that um, one of the, the, the really striking things about the book is that you, you find in the file that you are suspected of um, quite distinct kinds of spying at different uh, points throughout your career. Um, and maybe you could describe what those different suspicions on the part of the security officers were, how they changed um, sort of how you account for them, uh, these these changed kinds of suspicions. Mm -hmm. Okay, I should <clears throat> probably make clear that I went back to Romania a number of times. So my first project was 1973-74, about one full year. Um, 
And then I had a couple of other long projects. Well, I guess I mentioned this at the beginning about the different books. Um, but I was in different parts of the country for much of this. Uh, and Hungarian. Um, and uh, then I spent some time in the eastern city of Yash in Moldavia, the Romanian part of Moldavia. <coughs> and uh, so I was under the gaze of different secret police um, offices for each of these. Um, and at the beginning, uh, they were mostly concerned that I was a spy for military purposes because I had ridden my motorbike right into a military base um, without realizing it very early in my stay. And so there is a <clears throat> there are some documents in the file that say, you know, some military guy was up there and keeping watch, uh, found out that I'd been riding my bike around with this uh, red license plate that immediately gave me away as a foreigner, foreigner in an area where I wasn't supposed to be. So um, they assumed that my first task was to get information on military installations. And uh, that was what they uh, uh, kept following me for, for some time. Then, um, <clears throat> excuse me, adding to that, was once I moved into this village of out of Laiku, um, the there were a lot of uh, people from this village and surrounding villages that worked in a nearby town called Kujir uh, that had arm, an armaments factory. So the police assumed that I was interested in finding out about the armaments factory and talking with all of the. Um, people who commuted to Kujir from this village. <coughs> so from their point of view, I'd given pretty good evidence of being interested in things military and the idea that I was a military spy made uh, good sense. Um, then when I went back, uh, um, let me see, I'm just trying to remember now. One of the worst things that, uh, an outsider can be thought to be is uh, in that time, very highly nationalistic um, uh, regime uh, is to be a Hungarian if you're not, because there's a long standing dispute between Romania and Hungary over who should own Transylvania, where I was doing my work. Um, in addition, the fact that my name ends in a Y and is accented on the first syllable made it seem that I was or am some kind of Hungarian. So the police were worried about my um, et ethnic, um, uh, how can I say, loyalties. And many of them were quite convinced I was a Hungarian and I was going to <clears throat> do exposés on Romania from the Hungarian point of view. So that was a, being a spy for the Hungarians. First of all, the military spy, the second was the spy for Hungarians. Uh, and then, let me see, I wish I could, uh, what was the next one? Just a minute here. Um, well, I, I can't quite remember. <clears throat> <clears throat> the, the, the the dissidents, right? Uh, there was the oh yes, right? right towards the end of the nineteen eighties um, when I was there uh, again. There, I, I was meeting with people who were in the process of developing a um, some kind of dissident movement against the party and its leader Ceausescu. I had no idea that this was happening, but my various intellectual friends kept recommending me to me, uh, new people to meet. And it turned out that almost all of them, in retrospect I learned, were um, either um, involved in signing writers' protests against the government or uh, things of that kind. And there were a number of people in the, particularly the field of literature and, um, and history who were 
who were engaging in anti-regime protests. Now, these were, these were pretty mild because uh, if you did much of anything, they would just pick you up and throw you in jail. And then it happened to some people. But they uh, began to see that I was associating with some of the people they were following. And so then I became a spy for dissidents. I was going to be catching you know, up with their doings and uh, meeting them, finding out uh, uh, what plans they had. And then um, I would expose that. So those were completely different kinds of concerns. And they were, for the most part, followed by different secret police offices. So um, one of them was out in the county that I've worked in, Hunaduaro, that's where I was a military spy. Then I spent some time in the city of Cluj, where I was assumed to be a spy for the Hungarians. And uh, finally, towards the end, I was uh, assumed to be following dissidents, and I was mostly based in Bucharest at that point. It's, it's, it's striking that um, these different kinds of conceptions of what spying means, I, I think you, you write really compellingly about the very specific kind of assumptions built into what <laughs> Uh, what what spying meant for um, uh, some of these officers, um, and, and particularly the um, in the that sort of second phase where you describe their interest in um, basically you're gathering certain kinds of social or political information, um, and and essentially they see what what you're doing as an ethnographer as as somehow very suspicious. Or, or a particular kind of ethnographer that they don't seem to recognize. Right. <clears throat> and when I, excuse me, this throat has been giving me trouble all day. <clears throat> um, when I uh, first started reading the file, I was, um, I was struck by their interest in my, um, the interpretations I was generating. And in the file, I had they had uh, copied a number of my field notes, uh, photographed them. And in there, I get the pages that have been copied, all carefully glued to uh, pieces of uh, paper. And then occasionally underlinings by the officers who are reading them or little marginal notes uh, saying, uh, wow, this is really interesting. <laughs> And, uh, and other things of the like. So they were um, following what was going on in their own society in part through me. Therefore, I became an informer for the police on the uh, goings on in, in Romania. Um, now, I'm sorry, I don't remember the rest of your question. No, that's, that's great. I, I was gonna uh, mention this. It, this seemed to be one of the reasons that you gave for, for trying to sort of puzzle out why they why they didn't just kick you out, right? Why they were continuing to allow you to do uh, research. Right, um, well, as time passed, uh, especially in the 1980s, um, I was uh, uh, doing more research in libraries and, and less interviewing. Um, and they couldn't quite figure out why. I mean, they were in the library reading whatever I read and talking to the librarians to make sure they had all the titles right and so on. But um, uh, just remind me, what was the center of the question? Oh, so, so the, the, the reasoning for um, why they allowed you to- Oh, why I came, research, would come right? back. Right, okay. Um, so the, the uh, argu one argument that could have been made was that at the time, the uh, exchange arrangements between Romania and the United States were pretty important to Romania, um, partly because they used a lot of their man months, so-called, to send Romanians into the US to get uh, training in high technology, computers and so on. So they didn't really want to kick people out if they didn't have to. But they did ultimately, how can I say, they didn't kick them out, but they said, said to two anthropologists, 
uh, you're not welcome to go back in. They stopped them either at the airport or at the uh, some point along the border and sent them back home. Um, so it was possible to get kicked out. And they were periodically in the file indicating that they had some thought of doing this with me, but they never did. And so I began asking myself, why didn't they? And uh, to make a long story short, I came up with um, a sort of uh, an interpretation based on Michel Foucault's uh, famous paper lecture uh, um, called, what is it? Uh, this is why I retired. I can't remember things for more than five minutes. Um, uh, the idea of, of an author. Is that right? Yeah. So he says, he has some interesting things to say about why the idea of the author emerged in the 18th into the 19th centuries. And, um, and I took off from what he had suggested and said that, in fact, the, the spy for the secret police was um, what Foucault had said was that the author is a principle of gathering meanings into one place. That isn't exactly the quote, but that's the idea. So we have too much production of meaning, too many people writing things and so on. How to keep some kind of control on this was to gather them all under the um, identities of particular authors. And so I took uh, this idea and suggested that what was going on with the the spy was that uh, the spy was functioning as a principle of thrift in the possible um, uh, rise of opposition to the government. And so they had, they were, they gathered um, the notion of spy into four or five distinct categories. So you were the person spying for the military or the person spying for the Hungarians or um, the person spying on dissidents, or you could be other kinds of of spy that didn't apply to me, but would have uh, been in anybody else's file. And they kind of uh, board, uh, boiled down to the, um, am I gonna remember this? Um, anyway, lots of the ones that we've already talked about. It's not important to go into them. So I said that the spy was this principle of thrift in trying to contain opposition to the government, which was a government that had never been installed by popular uh, sentiment. And so dictatorships of that kind often have a problem with uh, self-legitimation. And I was speculating that the spy was one part of this. Uh, the spy was one, um, others included the, um, the rich peasant or Kulak, um, and so on. So they were, many of them were inside the country, but we were from the outside. And uh, it was very handy for them to be able to group lots of different people they were worried about under a, a handful of labels and then try to keep control of us in those categories. It, but then at the, at the same time, I think, as you point out throughout this book, they were also gathering information Sort of through you, at least in the in the rural areas, right where the uh, you, you you describe the sort of um, the idea that the security was not had not penetrated as much into the rural areas, and so in some ways it was useful for them to be um, right. listening in on you uh, talking to all these villagers, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's right. I think um, I read in some source that that the uh, Seguritate had penetrated about 15% in the rural areas as compared with, you know, the population uh, centers, which were, which held a much greater percent of the population, but still. So um, I and my other um, ethnographer friends from the U.S. and France and wherever they were from, were uh, a way for them to follow into these village settings. And indeed they did. I mean, they went into my bedroom and they talked to my landlord. They, my landlord was uh, enlisted as an informer. Uh, so he was constantly telling them who I was talking to and what I was doing. Uh, and they hadn't had that kind of relationship with him before. So uh, this, this was a great resource for the police, us going into villages. <clears throat> um, 
I want to just remind our audience uh, that they can go ahead and, and pose questions anytime. Uh, we'll, we'll, I'll start to incorporate some of the questions in the Q&A box as, as we move along. Um, could you give us some examples of the, um, some of the concrete uh, sort of techniques of surveillance that the, the, the secure state were, uh, used? Um, what kind of methods did they use to, to, to follow and survey uh, mm -hmm. people? Okay, um, they had, uh, first of all, people who followed us. So their own informers were giving reports to them on uh, what we did. Um, <clears throat> they, um, as I said, got into uh, my suitcase and, and the uh, filings of uh, the other uh, people from the US doing field work. Uh, they had uh, listening devices in um, the hotel rooms. I don't believe they had one in the room that I lived in in the countryside, but I had a lot of different visits to Romania and I was living some of the time in hotels, uh, usually on the eighth floor of one particular <laughs> hotel and all the Americans who were in Bucharest for some piece of business would be there. And therefore we knew that all of our rooms were bugged. Uh, and in Cluj, where I stayed the longest and had the most trouble with them, um, they set up um, uh, cameras in my room uh, so as to see who I was sleeping with or you know what I was doing. Did it look as if I were doing anything untoward? So um, I don't know if you can see this, but here is the cover of the book, uh, and the picture behind it is me in my hotel room making my bed, they have covered up my underpants, <clears throat> but I was you know, practically undressed. Uh, and the file contained uh, several of these things inside the room. When I, um, they also uh, would go to restaurants where I and other Americans might customarily eat and they'd sit at the next table or they planted microphones in a very large, um, cigarette um, trays that you wouldn't really ever think of looking underneath, but there underneath would be some microphones. So they were listening in um, by any means they could find. And the, 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 the degree, the number, the amount of resources that were put into this um, is, is really striking. There are, there, are, there are points in this account where um, I think this is later in the uh, later 80s um, where they're, they're following you almost 24 hours a day. The, the, the level of, of staffing and resource, I mean, it's just really extraordinary. Right. Well, that was when they thought I might be um, doing stuff with dissidents and they, that really was worrisome to them because it could mean um, that the regime would be overthrown and their jobs with it. So there was a question there. No, I, I'll, I'll move on to the next question, which is, yeah, okay. you, know, you, you mentioned the um, uh, informers, uh, which are of course a really important part of how this uh, system worked. Uh, and, and, and some of the most, uh, you know, striking parts of the book are the ones where you discuss the experience of learning about some of your acquaintances and even friends who had were informing on you to the uh, secure date. Could you, you know, tell us a little bit about um, that experience, uh, reading about it, and how you how you spoke to people about it and and uh, and, and wrote about that? Um, okay, uh, I always knew when I was there that some people could be reporting on me, but I had a, a totally uh, anemic view of what that might amount to until I read the file. Um, in, initially, it was mainly people like hotel uh, clerks who would report to the police on that I had gone out at eight o'clock in the evening and come back at 11, and that kind of thing was pretty innocuous. But then bit by bit, they would um, find out who I had been become friends with, uh, one guy that I was, um, that I got quite close to, they um, uh, followed him, but in fact, his uh, um, school 
um, was a principal advised uh, them to stay away from him and advised him to be careful of hanging out with me. Um, so I, I never really had found things from that particular guy. But then I hired three research assistants and um, they were much more aware of what I was doing because they were carrying out interviews for me. And uh, one of those people was um, um, roped into the work of informing. And uh, when I found the file and I was able to identify who he was, I was really appalled at how much detail he was able to supply, uh, including people that he thought I was sleeping with and uh, visits that I had from outside the village and so on. So that was, uh, that was a, a bit of a disappointment. And then the one that, um, that was the most uh, intensive was uh, that I had a, a romantic relationship with one of the friends that I had made there. And um, this was a woman and she uh, would invite me to go to her house uh, they would follow me to her house uh, and they knew that where I was going, they had uh, uh, listening in the room, but they also um, uh, forced her into becoming an informer. And she actually knew way more about my life than anybody else. Uh, and she and I had very long conversations after the revolution about what it was like for her to be an informer. And how she sort of, she blamed me for having uh, gotten her into this role. And um, so it was a really interesting and painful uh, set of conversations that I had with her. But the idea that somehow it was my fault um, was really novel. Uh, she'd had uh, traumatic experiences in her youth with relatives being uh, carried off by the police and never seen again. So. Uh, having them come to her and compel her into this relationship was a really terrifying experience for her. And I, um, you know, I still regret that that happened, but, you know, what can you do? Uh, I had no idea that this was happening to her at the time. And in, in the same uh, chapter that you discussed the, uh, informers or people who informed on you. You also uh, later um, well, later in the book tracked down several of the former uh, officers who were spying on you uh, and even managed to, to, to meet uh, a, a few of them. Um, could you speak a little bit about that? Um, and yeah, uh, this was a very fairly late um, idea on my part, I'd already gotten into writing the manuscript and had some ideas about how I would approach all of this. But the, um, it's important to note that the, in the files, the officer's reports are signed with their names. And so I had only to read the report through to the end and there was the guy's um, signature. Uh, and I knew what towns they lived in more or less and so I decided that I was going to try, there were three of them that had had a pretty active relationship with me. Um, one of them in the 1970s, and, and that was the guy who lived in the county capital uh, where my village was located. And then in the 19, early 1980s, um, there was um, another one who was, uh, where was he? He was in Bucharest. Uh, no, he was in the city of Cluj, and he was the one worried about whether I had Hungarian contacts. And then later in the 80s, there was a guy in Bucharest who um, um, was following me in connection with this dissident preoccupation. So uh, I had their names. Um, I did a variety of things. Uh, I I thought one of them uh, was a friend of a uh, good friend of mine. And she said, oh yeah, I can tell you where he lives. You know? And then another friend uh, called him up to try to make an appointment with me. And the guy agreed um, after a little hesitation. Um, the one in the county 
capital where I worked, uh, who, who did all of the stuff about my spying in the 1970s, uh, I had somehow, I had his name, but somewhere, I guess, in his, from his own personnel file, which I read, I got uh, uh, an idea of the address of his house. And it, it gave the street name, but not the number. It was a, in an apartment building. So I just walked down the street looking at the apartment <laughs> building numbers until I came to one that conformed to his. I bought a bouquet of flowers. I uh, rang the bell and when he answered it, I said, I have flowers for you. So at no point, and I had tried to phone him a couple of years earlier and he said he didn't want to talk to, to me. So I already had that experience. And uh, I went upstairs and there he was. And uh, so I got to see this person for the first time. Uh, he was quite suspicious at first, but then uh, his wife came and we were having a pretty pleasant conversation for the next hour, hour and a half. And um, we each asked each other questions about uh, what we were doing and what we thought about it. And I thought uh, he seemed like a very intelligent guy. Uh, and so that was that meeting. And then the third one was the guy in Bucharest who'd been uh, he actually accosted me in Bucharest in 1988, I think it was, when I was trying to meet a writer whom I later learned, who I later learned had uh, been part of this dissident writers movement. And so with him, um, I found his address in the Romanian white pages on the <laughs> internet. And um, I wrote him a letter and explained who I was and that I just wanted to have an opportunity to meet and talk with uh, some of the people who'd been interested in what I was up to. And um, that I was writing this book and that uh, uh, I would be very happy to meet him if he'd be willing to. And then I sent the letter on the internet to a former student of mine in Bucharest and had him put it in the local mail. And so he did that and I showed up and. Romania, as I had said I would, and the guy called me up on my cell phone and we set a meeting. So it was interesting that uh, at least two of them expressed interest in meeting with me, just as I had expressed interest in meeting them. Uh, and the conversations were, they had a tremendously disturbing psychological effect on me uh, because they seemed so nice. And I'm thinking, oh, why, how could these nice guys work for this dreadful um, op, you know, organization? Um, but it was uh, really quite useful for me to have those experiences and then follow up with various friends of mine who discovering that these officers were tightly embedded in social relationships. Duh, <laughs> what a surprise. Uh, gave me a completely different sense of how the organization operated. So that was very revealing for me and um, a little bit daring, according to my friends who were kind of appalled at what I was up to. I'm, I'm curious, coming out of those experiences, both the um, talking to, finding out about people who had in, informed on you um, and the conversations with the officers, um, sort of what kind of perspective did that give you on the, you know, now 30 year conversations in not only Romania, but other Eastern European countries about guilt, blame, responsibility, complicity of different people differently positioned in relation to the, the socialist regimes. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm curious where you, where you ended up uh, or how that, shaped your thinking about those those conversations? Uh -huh. um, well, the, as I said a few minutes ago, the most um, interesting to me was the, uh, the friend who had said, uh, you brought me so much harm, blaming me for having um, uh, done this, produced all of this surveillance on her and for her telling so much about me and the, to the officer. Um, so it was a really fascinating and not to say difficult conversation I had with this person. Uh, and the other lengthy um, uh, meeting that I had with a guy who had 
been involved in informing on me when I was at first in the village also um, was very enlightening. And he told me how terrifying it was to be recruited. Um, <clears throat> and every time he had to meet with the officer, he would have stomach aches the night before. And uh, his, what, another stomach ache? <laughs> what is it with you? You have something wrong. So, um, and he was completely willing to admit that this was, that he agreed to do this. He didn't blame me for it. Uh, and that uh, it had taught him something about his own society that he hadn't really wanted to know, but that uh, he had proved uh, important in his life. So those conversations were, were interesting and both in both cases, further deepened my relationship with the, the two people in question. Broadly speaking, did the experience of reading the file, doing the research and writing this book change in some fundamental way your understanding of either what everyday life was like during the socialist era in Romania, you know, in comparison to how you come into it? Uh, uh, or did it at all change how you thought about socialism as a kind of political, economic, and social system more broadly? Um, I guess I don't think it changed my um, way of thinking about socialism as a social system, but it gave me much more insight into the the mechanics of that on a very small scale. Um, I don't really know whether the people that uh, in my village, for instance, they, I often heard people saying, especially after 1989, oh, everybody thought you was a spy, you were a spy. And um, so that, that rumor was around. How many people knew that some villagers were also reporting on me? I don't know for certain, but the, my landlord's wife certainly did. She told me much later and uh, his uh, sister-in-law. So they had become aware that there was a, you know, a finger <laughs> in the, uh, or a fly in the ointment of the, the village that they might not have otherwise known. So I was an agent of some consciousness raising among those whom I talked with. Um, as for the nature of socialism, again, I think it was, I had already decided what I thought about socialism that might have been wrong, but I had my model of it in my mind. And this gave me uh, just more insight into how it was carried out, how it was that people became intimidated by being asked to be informers and things of that kind. So how people felt themselves caught in traps. Um, but there were other people who knew um, Securitate officers who my landlady at one point had a cousin who, was, who worked for them. Uh, she didn't tell me that until later. But uh, plenty of people who said, oh, yeah, well, you know, a guy, a friend of mine at work or, you know, my uncle. And they didn't seem to be so terrified by the idea. I was thinking that everybody was just cringing, waiting to find out who were the secret police officers. But a, a lot of them already knew that. I was the one who was cringing. Um, and so that was, you know, illuminating for me as well discovering the, the ways in which the police were penetrating the society were not necessarily just by frightening people, but also by being, you know, good neighbors and whatever. Hey, uh, audience members, please um, enter your questions into Q&A. Uh, right now we have one question, um, which I, I think relates to what you just um, mentioned now. Andy uh, Zhenju Tan asks, uh, says, uh, thank you, Professor Verdery, for this intriguing and thought-provoking book. You mentioned in your book that some of the interlocutors turned out to be uh, security um, informants. Does that revelation provoking you any doubt about the data you collected and the conclusions you drew in your earlier work? Uh huh. Okay. Um. I think probably 
not very much because a lot of the data that I was getting were things that were pretty uh, easily known um, from sources that I had some access to. Um, so for example, I copied down all of the birth, death and marriage records for my village from the mid uh, 19th century until the 1970s. Uh, but, and I had had to request permission to do that. But once the permission finally came through, I had no problem. I went into the county, the town uh, offices and sat there and wrote stuff down for several weeks. Uh, and um, so what I learned from that kind of thing enriched my sense of relationships among people in the village. And, um, and uh, that was very helpful for me. Um, also just to, apropos our current pandemic, um, I was reading uh, birth and death registers from the uh, church and they had uh, big, huge pages with names, about 10 names, lined sections across each page that would have the name of the person to whom something had happened, death, birth, or marriage. And then um, in, uh, at one point in these records in 1918, there was uh, a, there were uh, some families, couples who's, who were listed there as having lost children. And so they had child number one, child number two, child number three. It was all from the 1918 pandemic. And so I'm sitting there seeing this uh, and just feeling that I'm, you know, I have one instance insight into what, well, how horrible it must have been for these people watching these kids die, even though some historians say they didn't have the same degree of emotional attachment to children because children died so frequently, but this was a little different. Um, so that kind of data obviously is not something that I would then begin to question. Those data are that kind of data. I mean, you trust or don't trust church records or vital statistics re registers, but I can use those regardless of what the police were doing with me. Um, so if, if you can think of anything further you wanna ask, I'm happy to continue. Okay, um, so we have another question here. Jia Hong says, uh, I'm struck by the chain of circulating information in your story. Perhaps further expanding Andy's question, it's also striking that you, um, through your field notes, were uh, informing the state. Um, this provides a question on the nature of information circulating between people, the state, the ethnographer, and an uneasy question on the intimacy between knowledge produced by the state versus knowledge produced by the ethnographer. I wonder if you have any insights about the circulating information and the nature of knowledge produced by it. Uh, thank you. And I'll just piggyback uh, on that also, um, the question of what, what you think, uh, what kind of lessons of perspectives um, ethnographers working in other kinds of settings you think might uh, take from, from, from your uh, work. Okay. Um, okay. The, the information that I provided to the police was of great value to them. Um, and I know this because uh, in earlier periods in my work before I started putting things into a computer, uh, I would type out, I would print out my field notes uh, and um, number the pages and file them away. And they worked very hard to get into the suitcase, the locked suitcase in which I kept these notes. Um, periodically, I would mail out the notes to the through the American embassy to my office in, uh, at Stanford. But these guys got these notes. And so some of what was in the file was photographs of pages of my field notes, some of them with commentary by the officers, like, yes, <laughs> and exp explanation, exclamation points when I'm describing something about how um, uh, people in the village that I was working in a little bit later were um, managing to consume milk rather than deliver it all to the state collection um, centers. 
uh, things of that kind. Uh, lots of stuff that I wrote in there about the second economy, they had comment on most of it, brief but um, supportive. Um, so um, I would say their knowledge and mine sort of dovetailed in that sense. They got from me a greater sense of how it operated in day-to-day -day life. But um, the, the way they, I think the difference was not so much the information, but rather the way they and I processed it. So I had my theories about socialism and I was interested in trying to show how it quote unquote worked. They had their theories about spying and how that worked. Uh, so we were putting this same um, knowledge to different uses. Uh, then to the other question, lessons for ethnographers and other places. I think it's, it might be difficult to draw conclusions about that. And I say this just because of a few things that I've read by people who worked in completely different settings, like um, John Borneman has some work on um, his role as a suspected spy in um, Syria, where he did some research. Uh, and um, and then uh, Stephen Caton has a book about being thought a spy in Yemen. So two completely different circumstances from mine. Um, and they weren't being followed by secret police. The, they didn't, they weren't part of an operation whose intention was to create um, a, a specific understanding of the this spy-like person in their midst uh, and to use it towards uh, shoring up the regime that the secret police were serving. So this was mainly in the service of local, um, their uh, Bornemans and uh, Catons, the surface of, of local uh, vendettas and things of that kind, um, not necessarily organized by a central um, police organization. So it's pretty hard to say, well, when you're, in, I can say when you're in my kind of circumstance, uh, what you should do is be really much more careful than I was about being followed and uh, and so on. But for people who've worked in other circumstances, I pretty much don't have lessons to, to offer. So we have just two minutes left um, and ho hopefully enough time to answer this uh, last question, which is in some ways a, a, a context or definition question. Uh, Margaret Aguiar asks um, whether you could differentiate between uh, the socialism you experienced in Romania and something like democratic socialism in the Scandinavian countries. I think she's asking about how the distinction or between socialism and, and dictatorship, for example. Uh-huh. Uh, that's, um, that's big. Yeah, perhaps too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that the socialism in Romania, and I've argued this in various publications, the socialism in all of the um, Soviet bloc was its own particular kind of socialism that involved, in most cases, nationalizing the central means of production and operating them through um, the state and state bureaucracy. Um, whereas the Scandinavian cases um, haven't done that kind of uh, um, socializing the means of production to the same degree. Their emphasis has been particularly on welfare support of the population uh, rather than on the sphere of production. So I think it's two completely different kettles of fish if, if you will allow me that. Um, and what my experiences in Romania don't really give me a lot to go on for thinking about the Scandinavian cases. Well, unfortunately, uh, our time is is up. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Catherine Verdery, for for joining us. Uh, and and I really recommend uh, this book to anyone who hasn't uh, picked it up yet. Uh, well, it's been a great pleasure. I hope other people have found it to be so. And uh, please read the book. <laughs> it's it's written so that you don't have to have a whole lot of academic claptrap to plow through. Uh, it should be uh, accessible. <laughs>
Thank you, uh, everyone, for attending. And we hope to see you at our last couple of events this, this quarter. And, and again, uh, good evening to everyone. And, and thank you to Eugene and Catherine. So good night, everyone. Hey, good night.